Welcome to Canada Social Changemakers. My name is Justin Douglas, and today I am here with the iconic, the super talented, the incredibly inspiring Canadian actress, Tantu Cardinal. Tantu has been in over 120 movies and television series. She is a member of the Order of Canada, and she's the recipient of the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Canadian Academy for Cinema and Television, as well as being a fierce advocate for Indigenous rights and environmental protection. So thank you so much for being here today, Tantu. Thank you, Justin. How's that? outrageous intro. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to acknowledge before we get started that today I'm in Victoria, British Columbia, which is on the unceded territories of the Lagwankan speaking people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations, as well as the Wasanich peoples. And I'm very grateful to be here. So welcome. Thank you again. Uh, just to get the interview going, can you tell us a little bit about where you were born and your early life? I was born in Fort McMurray, Alberta, where um, I was being raised by my grandparents. Um, that was a long, long time ago. And then when I was maybe around four, maybe, I don't know, we moved to Anzac. Mm -hmm. which is just a bit south of Fort McMurray. Fort McMurray was a very small town at that time. And, and Anzac was a place along the railroad track that ran from Edmonton to Fort McMurray at that time. And it was called Anzac because there was um, a soldier training program in Edmonton. And there were soldiers from the Australian New Zealand Army Corps that were there. And, and um, I always wondered, what's Anzac? And why were we named Anzac? And I was told there were soldiers that slept beside the tracks. And then later on, I found out that they were soldiers that had helped build that railroad from Edmonton to Fort McMurray. Interesting. Yeah. And so, but other than that, I was raised in kind of a bush community. It, it would have been called an isolated community at that time, but there was a, a train that would come in one direction, one part of the week and go back out to Edmonton, uh, the other part of the week it would, um, would take stuff through to Fort McMurray and back out again. And how do you uh, self identify in terms of your culture. Well, um, what I'm saying these days is that culturally. Uh, I was raised as Métis. Language, I had Cree and Michif. Mm. Um, spiritually, I'm from my Nakota people. And um, Dene, just for kicks. <laughs> <laughs> I never really? learned language. Eh? And, okay. um, and my, my grandmother is um, Cree and Dene and Nakota. Her, her father was Nakoda. And how did you maintain a sense of your, your own identity and your culture growing up in a time in Canada of assimilation and basically cultural genocide? Well, you don't know it when you're a kid, but when you're an adult, you find out there's, there's all this colonialism that's just hanging from you in your mind and, and in your being. It's just kind of hanging all over and it just just feels yucky um and so i guess it the the cork came off for me when i went to the city to go to high school and my junior high teacher who was from a mennonite background arranged for me to go to Edmonton. He arranged for a bursary for me from Northland School Division. He arranged a place for me to build it. And he really had high hopes for me, but I was infested with culture shock and, and all the rest of the stuff that uh, comes along with being indigenous and from abandonment and from shattered families and, and the effects of genocide and colonialism and all that kind of stuff. That's a lot to sort through. Of course. And so for me, actually it was rage that helped me more than anything because when I got to the city, 
I, I really tasted and, and felt the racism and how treacherous it was um, to all of us of every age. But I always remember seeing this old couple walking down Jasper Avenue. They were obviously the grandparents of this beautiful young boy. He was probably about eight. And he was just full of, of health and joy and seeing the city and he's skipping along the street. And it just, boom, it just hit me. You know what? There's racists all over this place that are not going to be happy to see this happy child. Mm. They're gonna have to take that light out of his eyes. They're gonna have to make him feel like a piece of shit pretty soon here, you know? And, uh, and it's, it's just, it's moments like that that um, that just made it crucial that I had to do something. And I, I was just searching for whatever it was that, that I could um, participate. One of the, one of something that, that I, I noticed way back then is um, responsibility, is the ability to respond. And, and so, I had to really check through the influences that were emerging in my life at that time and see what it was that I could respond to because there was so much I could not. Yeah. I would not respond to, you know, I would just rather not participate if that's all that I was offered. And um, so that's how I dealt with all of those scuzzy things that land on you. But somehow through that all, you managed to have this incredible career in this industry that is not always open to minorities, to people of difference. And you, in my opinion, like really shattered the ceiling in terms of indigenous actors, in terms of women portraying roles. And I'd like to talk about all of it, but uh, how did you start? How did you get into acting as a career? Um. Just a second. Here is a picture of Harry Daniels. Mm -hmm. He was, I don't know, what was he? Was he president of the Métis Association of Alberta at the time? Or was he vice president? Or was he a counselor? He was involved in the political movement in Alberta. Um, at the time, and he's gorgeous and, and full of fun. And he had some acting training in Florida, uh, studied Shakespeare way back before he came to Alberta. None of us knew that. And uh, CBC put out the call because um, we had the mandate from the Canadian content ruling to do Canadian content films. And so there was a film going on, uh, I think it was Jackie Mack, who was at CBC at that time, was doing a film on Father Lacombe. The truth of the history of Father Lacombe was not a part of it. So that's both something that both Harry and I had to deal with. We had to be able to put a cap on part of it because it was important <clears throat> that we had to show that we could actually act. Because at that time, uh, it was well known that we as Indigenous people were not in touch with our feelings. And um, we were very stoic. And I mean, there were so many misconceptions. I remember seeing a script about my character having hard brown hands touching something or other, you know. And I thought, well, my hands are brown, but they're not hard, my <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, there's so many things that were ridiculous that, at the time. Yeah, oh, they still are today. No, but you know, I mean, we come from a place where our names were taken away, our clothes were taken away, our families were taken away, our siblings were taken away, everything was taken away. And then we were being blamed. When I was, you know, the times that I'm talking about coming to the city in the late 60s and early 70s, we were being blamed 
for the incarceration rates, the suicide rates, the dropout rates, uh, you know, all of this stuff. So big changes. Yeah, I mean, that transitions a little bit into my next question because you've been part of such, so many iconic films uh, throughout your career, Dances with Wolves, uh, Smoke Signals, uh, A River Runs Through It, these incredible movies that have sort of become- River Flow North, not A River Runs Through It. What did I say? A River, a river runs... Flow North. A River Flows North, excuse Where me. Where the rivers flow north. We a River Flows North. Don't, don't, don't name it that. And then here's this other film that comes out that same year. Mm. But the river runs through it. So our uh, title kept on getting mixed up with that one. Yeah, thank you for correcting me. I should have fact checked that one a little harder. <laughs> anyway, the point is you've been in all of these iconic, wonderful movies and you've had some incredible parts. Uh, but one of the things that you've said is sometimes you feel as though your characters have been there to support other people's stories lines. And uh, maybe can you expand on that a little bit? And, and you also said, you know, some of those characters for yourself could have been expanded on and explored more. And, and, and how so? Um, well, I don't know. We'll think of a movie. What was the movie that I was talking about? It was uh, the interview with uh, Tom Powers on, on uh, CBC Radio, I think is where uh, he said that. Okay, what is a story about? Or even examples of tokenism, <laughs> places where you felt as though um, you've either been pigeonholed into a part or, or tokenized as the indigenous well, person. You know, well, look at the society. How much respect do we as indigenous women have in this majority society? How important have we been to the stories of now and today? And how much is known about Indigenous women's participation in the foundations of this country? Not very much. Not very much. And what is pretend to be known is, is misinformation. You know, uh, people may be aware that in the Iroquois society, there was uh, a, a grandmother's council that directed the society. Same thing was in the Cree society. Same thing was in the Dene. We're, we're a matrilineal civilization. And that's what the majority of this Canadian um, milieu is not aware of at all the incredible contributions that we as Indigenous women have made. You know, we, as, as Indigenous people, there's a tendency to think of men. Right? Um, but uh, women, very, very uh, extremely important in our society. And I was talking to a friend of mine just now who was in charge of Imaginative for many, many years. And he's saying up until about five years ago, it was mostly men that were getting the support in, in uh, filmmaking and all of that. But now he said the, the majority of filmmakers in our world are, are women. So there's a big shift. Yeah, do you feel like it's shifting from when you started into where we are now in terms of Hollywood? Mm -hmm. Enormous, enormous, enormous. Um, for one thing now, if you say, if you suggest that there's something more to, to this woman's participation in this, there's a likelihood that there's someone there that will understand that this may be true. Whereas there was a time in, in my world, in my career, in my walk, where as a, if I suggested it would be, oh, that's just a romantic idea. You know, so you had to have some, some uh, heavy backup. Um, and then again, it depends on the people that you're working with. And this is what I would always watch for. I would watch for the people who have the capacity to open their minds and open their hearts. And, and, uh, and that's where the progress is being made from the people who want to make changes and that are able to, to open those doors, to allow new ideas to come in that aren't threatened. Mm -hmm. by yeah, because yeah, I think you have, you've opened those doors, I think for a lot of other indigenous women as well, because I think you were one of the, the forerunners. And I have to guess, I don't know for sure, but when you first start in an acting career, 
the goal is to get work. And so, you know, through my own experience, I would say, I would say yes to projects that I wouldn't necessarily feel super passionate about, but it's an opportunity to lead to another project where I would have more say and more ability. And so I imagine that's the case for any actor, but for someone of a particular minority group who then could be misrepresented in terms of those television choices, it's hard. It's hard to say yes to these projects and it's hard to say no to these projects. And how have you grappled with that, with that throughout your career? Well, I first got involved because of the changes that have to be made in the minds of people and, and the experiences of people. So I didn't get involved because I was an actor. I got involved because I was very upset with what was happening in our nations and happening to our people and happening to us and happened to my mother and happening, you know? And so um, that's why I got involved. So it was not surprising to me at all, at all to run into these scripts and these stories where there is a mess and then you just try to do something that will progress it a little further because uh, you know it's it's just too big for a little actor to make those changes and you can only make little changes and and plus the education system was was such a mess that i didn't have the confidence that i could write a script or that i could be a director or i could be a producer there i just had too much baggage uh mm -hmm. to go in that direction yeah but somehow you've overcome it because you've been able to now be a way shower for so many other youth for so many other indigenous people for women and people like me who are just really inspired by by your performances and what you've been able to achieve with your career and uh you were just in a film well 2018 in general was i think a pretty big year for you i think you were in something like five films at the toronto international film festival and uh number one in a movie called falls around her and i think this was the first time that you were number one on the call sheet so can you talk about that yes that yeah. shift yes and it just felt so liberating it was almost um it it, it was like i don't know it, sweat lodge is not a, a really good example for people who are um who have not been a part of the sweat lodge but it just felt like it's such a cleansing to be able to, to walk in and start working on this movie that I didn't have to worry about the politics, I didn't have to worry about wardrobe, I didn't have to worry about anything in terms of representation. It was just go and do the work. And, and working with people who also were in that very same place. And, and it was, uh, it was such um, uh, a beautiful moment really you know, uh, a freedom and uh, a flow of creativity that, that wasn't being obstructed or that had to be tempered to present kind of thing. Yeah, and I think it also is a game changer in terms of having you as number one on the call sheet means that now more Indigenous women, more Indigenous people, more minorities can be number one on a call sheet and can make really good, inspiring creative films that can be sold to a wider audience. And I think that's one of the big shifts that's happening now. I mean, for so long, the people behind the scenes have been privileged cisgendered white men making these decisions. And now finally, it feels like there's, there's a shift behind the scenes with female directors, female producers, female camera people. And, and just from my own experience being on set in, in the small Canadian capacity that when I first started, I saw very few women in terms of the crew. I saw very few women in terms of the higher ups. And I've seen that shift. I, I'm seeing that shift and I hope that continues. But when these projects happen, that's what opens the door to these things. You know, it's unfortunate that we have to prove ourselves as minorities. I say that as a member of the LGBT community, but that we have to prove ourselves as being capable and just as worthy as the other privileged people who are already in these parts. And you do it so beautifully and so well. Um, and it's also, I think, really inspiring to other Indigenous women who maybe didn't see themselves as being capable of being in this industry. So uh, I watched a short documentary, I think of her name was Nico Deloso, who did this little piece on you I saw on YouTube, and she was so inspired 
by the work that you have done and you are so inspiring to other young people, to indigenous women, to people like me, like I said, what advice do you have for people who want to get into this industry? Follow your, follow your heart, follow your inspiration. Why do you want to get into this industry? And, and keep that in mind and, and keep pursuing that. And there's going to be lots of no's. There's going to be a lot of rugged fences that you're going to have to climb. They got little prickles sticking out of them. But it's, it's you, the artist, that, that kind of pushes that forward. And in, in my practice, I always went back to my ancestors. Because I think, you know, in terms of where I come from, that is why I was where I was. That's why I was pursuing what I was pursuing. And that's where the gems are, is where I come from. So, uh, you know, so much of my work is trying to keep tabs with what are the messages that are coming from there and really trying to block out as much of the colonial as I possibly can. And, and we're all in a process of getting rid of the, the, the colonial concept of existence here and, and um, on the planet, actually. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work involved in that. You're, you're trying to do your work you're trying to do the story that you're trying to tell. You're trying to do your art. And then all of this stuff is kind of creeping in and then you have to sort it through. And we always learn something when, when we're doing these things. And, and getting rid of, of colonialism and, and the impacts of genocide, all of that is a work in progress as well. And, and then you'll do something and you'll go, oh man, no, that's not what I think anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so there's, there's a really a requirement to be, be kind and to be patient with, with, we're all going through so much change right now. It's very exciting, but it also is requiring a lot from us to remember humanity. Yeah, it feels like there's a reclamation of of culture, of returning to um, a more of a balancing with, with nature and mother earth, but there is this dichotomy at the one time of people who are aware of climate change, environmental degradation, and who are wanting to make a positive contribution. And then there's sort of, let's call them like the old guard who are obsessed with oil and obsessed with capitalism and, and taking everything out of the resources and living for this moment and not for future generations. And you have been, such an activist for such a long time. Uh, I think you sort of mentioned it's inherent within your nature and it's part of the reason you got into acting, but you've also taken that to the streets, literally. In 2011, you were arrested protesting the Keystone Pipelines with Margot Kidder. You've been very active in demanding environmental protection. Um, where do you think we're at now and, and in terms of that dichotomy? Well, we're, we're at a crucial place that even the, the least alert are starting to catch on that there is an issue uh, with our climate. Um, I think I can see um, progress in terms of relationship with the earth. Uh, in, in my world as the indigenous world, remember that I, I came into this world in 1950 where genocide had been practiced and in a territory where it had been practiced thoroughly because they're after that tar sands, after that oil that they knew about in the late 1700s. And so it was a tactical approach to all of that because the treaties were there and the treaties are so powerful that they had to put the people to sleep. Mm -hmm. And that's the purpose of genocide is to get rid of the power of those treaties. That work went on, that's conscious work on the part of the forefathers and a part of the leaders of this country. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think that it's becoming 
not quickly enough, but starting to seep into the mainstream consciousness of Canadian society. But to me, it's always struck me the dichotomy of uh, these treaties, which were a part of people who are equal members in the treaty negotiations. But then there's also this thing called the Indian Act that comes in and then suppresses all of the people uh, who are subject to the Indian Act to this legislation that no longer makes them equals, but subjects of the state that they were not inherently part of to begin with. And I think that was a clear, like you were saying, a clear attempt to destroy culture in order to have access to land resources. And because in my opinion, and correct me if I'm wrong, indigenous culture challenges the patriarchy in a way that people who are in power find very threatening. And if you are uh, able to do that, I mean, I've heard you mention in other interviews, the matriarchal nature of some indigenous societies, um, the balancing and the challenging and different worldviews is very scary to people who have a very limited capitalistic neoliberal understanding of our planet. Sorry, they... that was my, that wasn't a question. That was, that was more of a, my, my two cents in there, but uh, um, you've also commented a little bit on the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. Some of the movies that you've done have dealt with uh, violence against indigenous women. You know, in Canada, we are, are uh, stained by the history of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, where do you think we're at now in terms of the Truth and Reconciliation Committee and are we moving forward as a country? Um, I'm not really involved in the inner workings of it all, what's happening legislatively. Um, I know there is an enormous amount of work that's going on within our communities. It's such a deep-seated um, issue and has been with us since the Euros got over their scurvy. Um, because we have always been a threat. There is a mindset that really, really, really believes that life cannot go on unless this renewable, uh, unless this extractive industry is strong and powerful, unless the oil lobbies are, are rich and flowing, you know? And that's the absolute antithesis of the way that I see how we're going to survive. But also, it's a fascinating time that we're in because there's nothing more powerful than the force of Mother Earth. So if these men are really intent on challenging the power of Mother Earth, it's going to get really interesting. And, uh, and I think, you know, I mean, there's, there's this, it's a form of insanity. And I keep on thinking about uh, when I was with the Rights of Nature Conference and uh, the scientists were, were reporting the behavior of fish in water that was getting too warm. And, and the changes that were happening in the ocean because of that is that it kind of makes them crazy. They'll head toward danger rather than darting away from it, which is something mm -hmm. that they would do back when there was some balance in, in the climate, in, the, in their environment. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things that people are doing that are related to anxiety, and fear and you know anger all of this kind of stuff on the the negative end of the spectrum mm, you know the the positive thoughts in the air and the healing thoughts in the air have been so non-existent you know with with trump kind of coming to that pinnacle and it's, and it's bled over into Canada, big march in Montreal, all these people with no masks on their face and, and just absolutely determined that they're right. And, and it's, it's really kind of frustrating because I would love for my grandchildren to have some freedom and they're not gonna have freedom until people recognize the science of putting something across your face. 
Yeah. I mean, do you think that there are any other lessons that COVID is trying to teach us as a planet? I mean, whether you're a conspiracy theorist and it, and it started in a lab or it came out of the markets in, in China or the mink farms and it's mutating because of how we treat animals. I mean, is it a time for humanity to pause and be like, hey, wh what are we doing here? Oh, my yes. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's time for each of us. To, to make those decisions. The, a lot of the things that are going on out in the world, you don't have to be involved. All you have to do is make your decision. Is that who I am or is that not who I am? And um, I think we're kind of building our own, our own um, pods of existence. And, and I think that the, um, the, the COVID moment has really, it's almost like Mother Earth said, okay, okay, all, all right, everybody go to your room. You think about this now. And, and a lot of people have gone to their room and they have thought about this. And a lot of people have gone to the room and they just got mad and people have not gone to the room and they've gone out into the streets and they're starting raising hell over there. That's not being in touch with your mother. And um, I think that the, the virus has been an absolute microscope on all the places of weakness, all the things that are not stable about this um, patriotic, <laughs> patriotic civilization that we've created here. I think that we we can go deep now, and I love it that you know our filmmakers are getting stronger, our presence, our visibility, is is getting stronger. I love the um, Black Lives Matter movement because it is moving humanity uh, forward, and um, we can benefit off of any kind of humanity that can get stirred up. Yeah, true that. Absolutely. How do you maintain your own sense of groundedness through all of this? I mean, you are in an industry that is often so much about illusion and, and these sort of superficial things, and you're trying to sort of be your own genuine grounded individual. How do you maintain that? How do you heal from the trauma of all these things that you are constantly being bombarded with? Prayer, um, groundedness with our planet Earth. I have exercises that I do that ground me. Um, and, and, and prayer, focus, um, meditation, uh, listening. Um, because prayer is one thing, but listening, that's another part of it. Um, all, of, all of this all of this walk has been connected um, spiritually. And so there again, there's been a lot of cleansing and nitpicking and because our relationship with creative force was outlawed. They say our religion was outlawed. We don't have religion, we have relationship. So, um, there's, there's a lot of work that goes on in terms of removing yourself from churchianity over to relationship with natural force. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of scam in the course of that with the, the brainwashing that's gone on because this extractive industry really needs you to to be there at 9 a.m or 7 a.m or 5 a.m committed and anything that shakes that confidence is is uh, frowned upon i would think mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah challenges the status quo for sure um we're next to this American juggernaut of a film industry, and yet you've still managed to to keep your ties to Canada and the Canadian film industry. Um, how have you done that, and what do you think of where we're at in terms of Canadian filmmaking? 
Um, uh, I think Canada has a real opportunity to create unique stories. And I really hope our filmmakers continue in that direction. I hope that our Indigenous filmmakers remain committed to our way. Um, of course, there's all kinds of influences that go on. And um, I, I really hope that the influences are, are grounded, um, that our, the, what we choose for influences are, are grounded in the long-term roots, strengths, principles of who we are as human beings, because we're going to need every strength um, when all of this, what, they, what they're calling climate change right now, uh, could might well turn into devastation. Mm -hmm. So uh, in order to come through that in the best way possible, our humanity has to be strong. And it can't be based on the color of your skin or the kind of jacket you're wearing. Um, and we really have to advance ourselves as a species to be able to uh, consider our, our other relatives, our four-legged relatives, our winged relatives, the ones in the water and the medicines and all of this, because we can't survive without them. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it's really important that we reestablish relationship with that. Is there anything that you still want to do that you feel like you haven't achieved in your career so far of oh my gosh i i feel like i have achieved what i initially stepped out of the gate for that was to let the world know that there's lies going on folks and that we are capable of incredible storytelling and we can do films like nobody's business and we have incredible talent all over our, our communities, all over our nations. And I feel like that's well on the way. Now I can do things that I wanna do. Now um, I will be involved in doing, um, creating things myself. I'm, I'm now stepping into the world of writing and stepping into the world of producing and who knows, directing might well be next. But um, I'm just feeling so much more freedom. <laughs> I'm so much more freedom now. I feel like, uh, okay, I'm released. There was so much tension traveling through that road since the, well, about 68, I guess, 1968. And uh, there has been a lot of changes and you know a lot of those changes. We all know a lot of those changes. So now we can create based on the impulses that are hitting us, like you're doing this show. Thank Who you. knows what'll be next? Yeah, I hope so. I really hope that there's a space for more um, social justice, thought-provoking cinema that has the ability to appeal to the masses because so much of what we see and so much of what we consume is about escapism from from our realities, but there's also a lot of really great stuff that's happening that can be explored. And some of the projects that you do really do do that. They, they challenge the mainstream status quo in a way that a lot of Hollywood actors are not able to do. And I think that's one of the reasons why I do think you're such a social change maker. And uh, before I let you go, what are uh, other young indigenous filmmakers in Canada, how um, are their projects, how does social justice start to envelop into the space of what we would consider the, the mainstream dominance of Hollywood? That's not an easy question, I know. Um, no, the first part of the question, how are you placing it? Well, I mean, it's really up to you, but how, how do you see the space evolving from what we've seen as very much you know, the Superman type of movie or um, these superheroes, these as opposed to pieces being created by indigenous artists 
about their own stories, about social justice, about the environment. How do we get these into the mainstay of not just like, you know, independent film festivals, but part of the, the bigger picture um, um, conversation? Well, you get Taika Waititi to do Star Wars <laughs> and to do an indigenous res dogs and, you know, and, and, and it's supporting our filmmakers. It's, it's getting behind our filmmakers. It's so difficult to get anything done because of this essential attitude that Indians don't belong here. And so we really need people to get beyond their, that, that, that fear, I guess, that, that blocks the resources from flowing towards our filmmakers. That's part of it. And um, we're doing superheroes, we're doing all that stuff. And uh, there's a lot of the, the Canadian and the American audiences are not seeing it, but it's going on anyway. And it's going to burst through. So um, yeah, keep that in mind, uh, along with, um, the the language the the land acknowledgement comes the idea that we still live here that we belong and what i hope comes through with land acknowledgement is that the land is acknowledged but also the people who have kept that land healthy mm -hmm. are acknowledged as well Tantu Cardinal, you are a way shower, you are an inspiration, you have broken this glass ceiling, in my opinion, for women, for Indigenous artists, for people like me who are just inspired by incredible acting and incredible activism. I thank you so much for your time. I wish you all of the success in your future projects and endeavors. I will be watching, I will be cheering you on, and I can't wait to see what the future holds for you. Thank you again so much. Thank you so much. Have a Merry Christmas, you two. Merry Christmas. <laughs> okay, bye.